So now that we went through the theory of sequential logic and uh, time, we can go ahead and begin building the memory units that we need in order to build our computer. Uh, before we do that, let's uh, revisit the von Neumann architecture and uh, observe that one of the major players of this architecture is something called memory. Now, when we say memory in computer hardware, we mean many different things. First of all, there's main memory, which consists of the memory that resides actually inside the computer and hardwired into the uh, uh, computer's uh, motherboard. And uh, this main memory also divides into several different categories of memories. The most famous one is called uh, RAM, or the random access memory. And then there's secondary memory, like hard disks and uh, memory sticks and, uh, uh, and so on. And then there's also the distinction between volatile and non-volatile memory. For example, when you pull out the plug of the computer, the RAM is effectively erased. At the same time, uh, the information which is stored on the disks and uh, on, on flash memory and so on uh, persists even when the computer is not connected to a power supply. So we have uh, this distinction. Uh, the RAM is used to store both the data on which our programs operate as well as the instructions which are the building blocks of the programs themselves. And we will talk about this duality later on in the course when we talk about the overall computer architecture. And finally, another uh, comment that I want to make before we actually start this unit is that, like anything else, when we talk about memory, we can talk about it from a physical perspective, how we actually build the memory, what kind of technology do we, do we, do we use uh, uh, in order to uh, realize uh, the memory. And we can also talk about the logical uh, organization of the memory. Now, in this unit, and in this course in general, we always focus on uh, logical considerations, and we focus in particular on the RAM unit, which is, uh, once again, the most important element of uh, the computer's main memory. All right. Now, before we actually talk about the RAM, we have to step back and talk about uh, the elementary building blocks from which memory is designed. So the previous unit ended up with a description of how a single bit register works. And it doesn't take a big stretch of imagination uh, to understand that you can take several such uh, uh, one bit registers and put them one next to the other. And by doing this, you can create an abstraction of a 16 bit number. And we call this abstraction register. The width of uh, the register in general is, uh, is, is a parameter. We call it uh, W. And in some computers, it's 16-bit. In other computers, it may be 32-bit or 64-bit. Uh, it turns out that it's not a terribly interesting parameter, because everything that I say in this lecture works uh, for uh, any width of, of memory uh, that you might uh, encounter. But from now on, I'm going to use w equals 16, because we are building a 16-bit computer. Uh, so we do this without loss of generality. Another thing that I'd like to say is that I'm going to use a lot the term registers state. And in fact, this term was introduced in the previous uh, uh, unit as well. Uh, a state is the value which is currently stored, quote unquote, inside the register. Uh, to say it more precisely, this is the value uh, which is currently being expressed by the internal circuits of, of the register. This is a more I think, accurate description of what's going on. It creates an illusion of, of storage, if you will. All right, so uh, here is the register. And uh, let's take a user's perspective of this, uh, of this uh, device. How do we read the value of this register? Well, it turns out that all we have to do is probe the out output. Why? Because at any given point of time, the out output simply emits uh, the state of the register. So if we just look up the value that comes out from out, we know what is stored inside the register in this particular uh, uh, time uh, cycle. Now, let us talk about uh, uh, how we write a new value into the register. So you know, we want, to, uh, we want the register to remember the number 17 from now on. What do we do? Well, we set in to this new value, let's say 17, 
and we assert the load bit. When I say assert the load bit, I mean we set the load bit to one. So here's what will happen. The register state becomes V, and from the next cycle onward, the output of the register will also start emitting this uh, value V. So from the next uh, cycle onward, the register will effectively store the new value 17. And it will keep on storing this value forever until we decide to change this value in the very same uh, manner that I just described. All right, so uh, we are now ready to give you an example of a register chip in action. And in order to do this, uh, we will fire up the uh, hardware simulator and show you how the register chip works. So to get started, I, I'm going to load one of my built-in register chips. And uh, in order to do it, I will select the NAND Tetris uh, uh, folder. And uh, within it, I'm going to Tools. And within Tools, I'm going to Built-in Chips. And by the way, everything that I do, you can do also on your computer. You know, all these folders are available to you also if, uh, of course, if you have downloaded the uh, Nanto Tetris uh, suite to your computer. So I'm selecting the built-in chips uh, directory and uh, opening it. And I see that I have all sorts of uh, built-in chips available to me. And um, all these chips are part of the hack uh, chipset. You know, these are chips that will come to play when we uh, piece together the computer architecture. And one of these chips is uh, called deregister. So let us load the deregister built-in chip into the simulator. And if I look at the HDL code, I see that uh, the HDL code is a little bit strange because it's a built-in chip. You don't have to worry about it because you don't have to build built-in chips in, in this course. You have to build them in plain HDL. But this code here says that uh, this chip is actually implemented by a Java class called uh, deregister, which delivers uh, the functionality of, uh, of a 16-bit register. So um, it also says that uh, this chip is clocked because, you know, it's, it's a register chip, so it receives a clock input. And because the HDL includes the magical word uh, clocked, we see that a clock icon has uh, uh, opened up in the uh, uh, control panel of the um, of the simulator, and this clock is used to simulate the progression of time within the computer, or more accurately, it uh, simulates. It can be used to simulate a train of uh, uh, cycles. So each time I click this uh, clock icon, I move one phase in the cycle. So you know this was a tick. This is a talk. Tick talk, tick, talk, tick, talk. So I'm progressing the clock manually. And of course, I can also write a test script that includes a command like a while true tick tock, which will cause the clock to, uh, to tick and talk forever. Or I can say something like repeat uh, 10,000 uh, uh, tick tocks uh, and so on. So, uh, but now we're going to do everything manually, and that's what you normally do when you build a chip and, and test it for the first time. So, uh, because this uh, chip is implemented by a Java class, we, we added to, the, uh, to these Java implementations all sorts of nice uh, features. Uh, for example, uh, the deregister has a GUI that, uh, uh, it's a GUI side effect that shows what is the current state or the current contents of this register. Happens to be zero because this is the default. So let's go ahead and uh, change uh, the, uh, uh, the contents of this register to something else. In particular, let's uh, change the register to uh, 17, my favorite number. So I'm changing uh, the in input, which is a 16-bit value into uh, 17, and I will run the clock forward, and I see that uh, actually nothing seems to happen. The uh, contents of the register remain zero, and so is uh, the output of the register. 
Well, nothing happens because I forgot to assert the load bit. So let's go to the load bit and turn it into one. And then we go back to the clock, we do a tick, and we see that um, the contents of the register change to 17, which is very nice, but the output of the register is still zero. And that's because, you know, it takes a complete cycle for the register to actually stabilize and begin to emit the new uh, state. So let's do a talk. And indeed, I see that once I move to the next cycle, the output of the register is also 17. And from now on, uh, the register is in a stable state. And the state is 17. And it will remain 17 until a point of time in which uh, I will decide to change it into something else. Now, you know, one thing which I may want to do is set the, uh, uh, the load bit to zero, and this will serve as a safety so that uh, uh, if inadvertently, you know, someone changes uh, the value of this register, uh, nothing will happen until the load bit will be asserted. So, so let's go ahead and, and change the value of the register, which is presently 17, to uh, let's say 23, which is uh, another one of my favorite numbers. So 23, and uh, I assert the load bit to 1. Uh, I do a tick, and I see that now uh, the register is kind of an inconsistent state, because the state of the register is 23, but the output is still 17. Once again, I have to complete the cycle in order to, uh, uh, to get to the, the register into a stable state. So I do a talk. And now the register is 23, but both uh, the state, the internal state of the register is 23, and also the, the register is itself has committed to this new value, and it emits the value 23 as well. So now I continue cl to click the clock, and the value of, of the register became uh, 23. So you know, this has been a demo of uh, the typical behavior of uh, the register and uh, let's continue with the lecture. So now that we understand how the basic uh, building blocks of memory work, registers, we can begin to stack them together and build actual memory units. And the general architecture of, uh, of these uh, units uh, looks as follows. Um, in fact, I can talk about it in terms of abstraction. The RAM abstraction, or the way we are used to think about memories, is we think about them as a sequence of addressable registers. It's as if every register has an address that ranges from 0 to n minus 1 in case of a, of a RAM device that consists of, of n uh, registers. Now, there's one thing which is very important to emphasize, which uh, makes this whole notion of uh, RAM uh, much easier to, to understand and to, uh, to comprehend. And this is the fact that irrespective of how many registers you have uh, in this uh, uh, RAM unit, and it may well have millions of such registers, at any given point of time, only one register is selected, and only one register is interesting. All the other registers don't take uh, any part uh, in the game, so to speak. So at any given point of time, we have to say which is the register on which we want to operate, which is the register that we want to read, or which is the register whose value we want to change. So we have to make a selection. We have to determine this, uh, uh, the address of this register. And we do it using an input which we call address. So think about it. If we have to uh, select one out of n possible uh, registers, using some sort of a binary code, how many bits do we need in order to create such a code? Well, it turns out that we need log of n such bits. For example, if we have eight registers, uh, we need three bits, right? Log of eight uh, on base two is uh, three. So uh, register number zero will be represented with the code zero, zero, zero. Rep uh, register number seven will be represented with the code one, one, one. And then we have all the possibilities uh, in the middle. So the length of the address input, which we call k in this uh, uh, diagram, uh, equals log of n, the number of registers in this particular RAM device. And finally, we have this w, which, as I said before, is not terribly interesting. w in our computer happens to be 16, 
But if you want, uh, uh, you, we can make this W equal some other number like 64, and everything that we say from now, now until the end of the unit will be just the same. So without loss of generality, W equals 16. Finally, I want, to, uh, 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 I want us all to remember that this is a sequential chip. It depends on uh, uh, a clock input, and that's why we have this little triangle uh, in the diagram. And this means that it has a clocked behavior, and the behavior is defined uh, as follows. Uh, if we use the label M to stand for the state of the selected uh, register, then if load equals 1, uh, M becomes uh, in, and from the next cycle onward, the output of this register becomes M as well. And uh, if load is not 1, the output of this register will be exactly as it was before. Okay, so this is the basic functionality of, uh, of this uh, RAM unit. Let us uh, say a few words about how we read and write values using this uh, RAM device. So to read a particular register, we do two things. First of all, we set the address of the RAM unit to the desired register number or address, you know, register number five or something like this. And then we probe the out of the register, uh, we probe the out of the RAM unit. And the out of the RAM unit is built in such a way, I mean, the, the internal circuitry is built in such a way that the out always emits uh, uh, the state of the selected register. So in this case, it will emit the state of register uh, number I. So that's how we read one register out of the millions of registers that may be uh, present in this uh, RAM device. What about writing? Well, writing is slightly more involved. If we want to write something into register number five, using the same example, we set address to five, we set in to 17, for example, we assert the load bit, and here's what will happen. The state of register number five will become 17, and from the next cycle onward, the RAM will start to output this value as well. And from now until further notice, uh, register number five will contain uh, uh, the value 17 until we, we change it again using precisely the same procedure. So we know how to read and write uh, uh, individual registers from a given uh, RAM device. Okay, I would like now to give you an example of a RAM chip in action. So once again, we are going to fire up uh, the hardware simulator and uh, we'll see some examples of, of uh, how the values of the registers change over time. In this demo, we're going to illustrate how a RAM device operates using the uh, hardware simulator. So uh, let us uh, open our built-in chip directory and look for some... Uh, uh, RAM device. We have several RAM devices in the hack chipset. Let's select a RAM 8. So I load the chip and uh, this is a built-in chip. It comes uh, with uh, a nice uh, GUI side effect which we see here uh, on the right hand side. And I can use this GUI in order to put some values uh, inside the RAM. So let's do it. Uh, so I'm just putting some, uh, you know, random numbers really uh, inside some of the uh, registers and uh, we can leave some registers as uh, zero. Uh, I'm just uh, entering values, you know, nothing interesting here and, and that's it. Now it should be understood that uh, what I did here is, uh, is uh, kind of cheating. That's not how you Manipulate a RAM device uh, in a low-level uh, fashion. So, so, so let's let's go ahead and do it uh, the right way, so to speak. Uh, let's uh, decide that we want to read, say, register number five. How do I read the contents of register number five? Well, I go to the address input of the RAM device, and I put the number five there, and uh, nothing seems to happen. But uh, if I run the clock. I see that the out output of the RAM device begins to emit the value uh, 8373, which happens to be the contents of the selected register, of register number 5. 
if I want to read uh, another uh, register, let's say register number one, well, I change the address to number one, I run the clock, and I see that I get the contents of register number one. What about changing the contents of uh, some of these registers? Let's say that I want to set the contents of register number four to uh, 12. So I go to this address here, to, to, I'm sorry, I go to the uh, address input of the RAM, I set the address to 4, I assert the load bit to enable the right operation, I set the value of the in input to the desired value, which we decided is 12, and then I run the clock. So. Um, in the first uh, tick, I see that the internal state of register number 4 became uh, 12, but the output of the RAM device is still something else. In order to uh, commit the RAM to the new value, I have to complete the cycle, so I do it, and I see that now uh, the RAM device uh, is also emitting the value of the selected register, which happens to be register number 4. So let's say that I want to change uh, another register, say uh, register number uh, 2. Uh, let us set register number 2 to the number uh, 17. So I go to, uh, to the address input, I set it to 2. I go to the input, to the in input, I change it to 17. I run the clock and uh, I see that uh, register number 2 indeed changed to 17 and uh, the out output of the RAM is now emitting this value as well. So this has been a demonstration of how a RAM unit operates. Now in this particular course we are going to build a family of 16-bit uh, RAM chips. Uh, all of them are going to have uh, exactly the same generic architecture but the details are going to be uh, slightly uh, different. So here are the chips that we are actually going to build. We'll build a RAM 8 consisting of 8 registers and the length of the address bit uh, is going to be log of 8 which is uh, 3, log to the base two, uh, 2 of 8. Um, RAM 64 contains 64 registers and 6 uh, address bits. Uh, then we'll create a RAM uh, whose size is half K of uh, registers and then uh, uh, we'll continue with uh, RAM 4K and RAM 16K uh, which is uh, what we finally need for our hack uh, computer platform. So these are the five chips that we are going to build and uh, the construction of these uh, uh, chips is going to be surprisingly simple as you will see in the next unit. Now, a sensible question is, why do we need these uh, uh, five uh, particular chips? And uh, the answer is, quite simply, because that's what we need in order to build our hack computer. And another interesting question that I sidestepped uh, until now is, why is this thing called RAM to begin with? Well, RAM stands for Random Access Memory. And I would like to note uh, at the end of this unit that uh, uh, maybe we didn't give this, uh, this chip uh, the, the respect that it uh, actually uh, deserves because something really remarkable happens with this chip and here is what actually happens. Irrespective of the size of this chip, ir irrespective of whether it has 8 registers or 8 million registers, I can select every register from this chip and apply uh, an operation on it in exactly the same access time, which is truly remarkable. All I have to do is enter the address of this uh, 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 register into the address input and boom, this register is going to be selected and all the other registers are going to be ignored. Okay, now there's no boom in reality, I'm doing it for dramatic effect, but actually it's quite dramatic because once again, uh, if I now want to select a register number 5000, all I have to do is enter 5000 and boom, this register becomes irrelevant and register number 5000 becomes uh, active and, and it, it, uh, it kind of opens up for business. And it doesn't matter if I have 
8 million registers or 8 billion registers, I have this basic ability to select at random any register in this configuration and either read it or write it in the same access time. So this is truly a remarkable functionality and later on in this week you will actually build this functionality uh, using uh, HDL. But before we do so, we have one more uh, chip uh, that we need to describe and uh, this is uh, the chip that implements a counting operation and uh, the chip is called counters and uh, counter in singular and uh, this will be the subject of our next unit.